So, all right. Uh, well, welcome, I guess, official uh, recording welcome for those of you who are here. Um, so, uh, so I am Chris Yokel. Uh, I'm, especially for those of you who may be watching this later, I'm a, a English professor uh, here at Bristol and I help uh, run the One Book program. Um, so I can actually tell you a little bit about that. Uh, so the One Book program is just, is a, is a, a community common read program uh, where each year we solicit nominations from, from you, the Bristol community, as to uh, uh, a book you think that we should engage with together as a, as a campus community. Um, and so we, we solicit nominations and then we, uh, uh, those of us who are more immediately involved in the program usually kind of have to read through those and sift through those and come up with a, like a top five that we think is a good representation of, of, of books. And then those get sent out again to the, the uh, Bristol community, uh, which includes everyone, students, uh, faculty, and staff. And, um, and then that gets voted on. And then the, the top vote becomes the, the one book for the next academic year. So this year, um, we have uh, kind of a unique situation in that it's, we have our first anthology. Um, so we've been, one book program has been around for over 10 years. And so this is our first anthology selection um, that includes a range of pieces. And so uh, this year's uh, book is Tales of Two Americas, Stories of Inequality in a Divided Nation. So it's edited by John Freeman, um, but it includes uh, 37 essays, poems, and narrative pieces from a whole host of writers, um, some well-known, uh, some who are probably new writers fresh on the scene. Um, so uh, well-known writers such as Anthony Dare, Sandra Cisneros, Roxane Gay, Richard Rousseau, Joyce Carol Oates, uh, we've got Annie Dillard, Ann Patchett are in there also as probably well-known writers. And then, like I said, you've got um, some also maybe lesser known writers and, and kind of new younger writers. Um, and so they touch on a whole host of issues, uh, social justice related issues from things like gentrification uh, to racism, to homelessness, to economic inequality, to immigration. Um, and uh, uh, it just seemed like a particularly good book in light of, uh, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, 2020, which just seemed to, um, you know, bring a whole host of these issues to the public awareness in a new way of just, uh, you know, so many ways in which our country is still unequal, whether it's, you know, um, just outright racism, uh, at, at, you know, in terms of like, you know, police community relations or, or whether it's like inequality in our healthcare system, right? We're seeing disparities in, in healthcare in terms of like, um, especially um, seeing how the, you know, the, the pandemic has affected, uh, you know, minority communities, especially like uh, Black and African American communities as opposed to white communities. You know, so we've seen disparities there. Um, so yeah, I think inequality is just, you know, a, a theme that we've seen in our country kind of rearing its head once again. And so this book tackles that in a whole host of ways with a whole host of writers from different perspectives. And so one thing we wanted to do, we thought would be good is because it's an anthology, we wanted to take this opportunity to just really highlight a variety of the pieces from this, from this book, um, since we have the opportunity to do that. So, so that's gonna be a big part of our programming uh, this academic year. Um, so each month of the academic year in which you know, we have, um, you know, we're meeting, uh, we'll host a discussion like this on a piece. And uh, I'll actually, I can jump ahead here for a sec. So, so this, uh, you may have seen this flyer around if you're at all on campus, uh, any campuses, I've tried to put some up around Fall River and I'm actually here at Attleboro today. And I know um, uh, Kathleen, who's actually on, uh, on our Zoom chat today, who's also part of the current One Book group. I know she's put some flyers up around Taunton 
And uh, I've tried to share this through Bristol Weekly and like uh, student um, student newsletter and stuff. But this is our schedule for the for the fall. Um, so uh, so today uh, this month we're looking at "Hooray for Losers" by Dagoberto Gilb. Um, next month we're going to be looking at the piece "Death by Gentrification" by Rebecca Solnit. Uh, November we're going to look at a, a fictional story, a short story "How" by Roxane Gay. And then in December, we're going to look at uh, The Worthless Servant by Ann Patchett. And so um, I will, uh, I will, uh, I'll try to remember to put a, a link, uh, put this flyer in the, in the link in the chat uh, a little later. And uh, with this QR code, uh, this is basically all these, um, you can register for all these events through the Bristol events page. And if you scan the QR code here, it will actually take you right to the Bristol events page. And then you can just go through and look, um, look for these events and, and sign up for them ahead of time. So, yeah. So today, um, so we have uh, our, this, our piece, uh, Hooray for Losers. So initially uh, there was supposed to be a discussion of this piece in August, um, but there was unfortunately kind of a mix up <laughs> with, um, uh, another um, area, another department in the, the school about, uh, yeah, just the Zoom setup and all that. And, and so it didn't happen. Uh, so I figured, well, let's just push it to September. And I thought this would be, uh, I thought this would be a great piece to start uh, our semester because it is, the piece is about education, um, particularly um, education and, and really thinking about privilege in relation to education. Um, so the piece is by Dagoberto Gil. Um, so I uh, have a little bit of his bio here. So he's the author of the novel, uh, The Flowers, uh, Gritos, an essay collection, uh, which is a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, uh, Woodcuts of Women, The Last Known Residence of Mickey Acuna, and The Magic of Blood. Uh, which won the Penn Hemingway Award and was a Penn Faulkner finalist. Uh, he also edited Hejo en Tejas, an anthology of Texas Me Mexican literature, which won the 2007 Penn Southwest Book Award for nonfiction. He has been honored with a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Creative Writing Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Whitting Writers Award, as well as regional honors such as the Dobby Pesiano Fellowship. Uh, he's been anthologized widely. His fiction and nonfiction have appeared in a wide array, array of magazines, including Harper's, The New Yorker, The Three Penny Review, The Nation, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, GQ, Plowshares, Slate, Eslan, Kalalu, and many others. Um, uh, Gilb has a BA and an MA in philosophy and religious studies from the University of California, Santa Barbara. He has taught at the University of Texas at Austin, the University of Wyoming, the University of Arizona, Vassar, California State University, Fresno, and Texas State University, where he was a full professor of English on its creative writing faculty. At the University of Houston, Victoria, so this is where I got this bio from, uh, Gilb is the executive director of Central Victoria Center for Mexican American Literature and Culture. Uh, he is also a writer in residence at UHV. Um, so quite a, uh, quite a CV. And I thought it was, I thought it'd be interesting particularly to read this CV because um, honestly reading, uh, reading this essay, I, I'm not sure you would pick up on any of that. <laughs> um, uh, just how, uh, um, yeah, like how much work he's done. Um, but just, he writes about himself in a non very in a very sort of uh, unpretentious way in the piece, um, which I think is just presents an interesting con and maybe this kind of already gets into this idea of privilege what like how we look at what it means to be educated and the ideas of privilege and um, how that makes us perceive a person right versus maybe how they present themselves or um, uh, in other bios, and I thought this would just be worth mentioning too. And of course, he brings this up in the in the, the essay. He, um, you know, probably at the time he was doing some of this, but then before he did some of this, he worked in construction for sixteen years, um, which doesn't, again, you know, maybe fit our idea of what the 
educated person or even the, the scholar looks like. So I think, you know, for, for these reasons, um, you know, I thought this would be an interesting piece to, to, uh, to bring up for our first discussion. Um, especially, you know, for those of you who here, here who are students, um, you know, coming to a school like Bristol Community College, uh, you obviously have, uh, you know, well, all of us do really have, um, you know, our backgrounds in terms of our upbringing is in terms of like, uh, you know, whatever um, expectations we were raised in, in terms of education, um, how we perceived education and, and, and uh, you know, based on our background, based on our social class. Um, so I thought, you know, that might be kind of a good place to start is, is like just throwing this out. Um, and actually I can, I'll stop sharing my screen now. <laughs> so that was the main, the main slides I wanted to share, but, but um, I thought, you know, this might be a good place to start is like, and this is really for all of us, right? Um, students, current students or past students, and now, you know, uh, professors or teachers, like, um, you know, what was your experience, you know, what was your, what was your expectation of, of education growing up? And looking back, how do you see that, you know, how do you see how that, um, how that maybe expectation was tied to your ethnic upbringing, your racial upbringing, your social class upbringing? Because I think, um, you know, one of the things that Gilb does in this piece and draws out is, is how interlinked those things are. Um, and how, uh, you know, certain expectations of education can be, you know, a form of privilege that we maybe don't realize if, you know, this is all we've known growing up. So, so I guess I'll throw that out. There's kind of a, a conversation starter um, for anybody who's willing to sort of dip their toe in first there. Like what, you know, in terms of your own background, what, what do you remember the sort of expectations um, of education being growing up in your home, you know, and, and how your background sort of factored into that. Well, I could talk a little bit about mine. I grew up in a very average family and uh, knew nothing about college. I went to a, a Catholic school, K through 12. And uh, at the time we had in, in Fall River, we had several private girls academies, again, Catholic academies that no longer exist. And my mother very much wanted me to go to one of them. It was called Sacred Hearts Academy. I really didn't want to go. I wanted to go to the local public school. And uh, so I ended up having a one-on-one a, a -on -one with the uh, principal at Sacred Hearts. And she gave me all the reasons to go. And I still didn't really want to go, but at any rate, I did. And I have to say that changed my life because mm -hmm. what it did for me coming out of a very, very average family, I'm talking about financially and educationally and everybody, was it showed me what else there was out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a whole group, I would say probably the biggest contingent, there were only 65 girls in the class, but the biggest contingent of those would be going on to college. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so there was a lot of college talked about the college, this high school curriculum was geared toward that, four years of Latin, three years of French, obviously four years of English, a lot of English literature in there, which I ended up studying further. Yeah. Uh, but that type of thing. And so I think it opened up for me whole new horizons on what, you know, talk of travel, talk about things that, that didn't happen in my home uh, because mm. we simply didn't have the money and yeah. uh and maybe the know-how either but i think get, being given that for four years and then i did of course go on to college and graduate school i think that for me was eye-opening even at 14 yeah. years old so uh yeah. that i can share that with everyone mm. yeah so i mean and that's i think such a common story, right? Um, which I think in is this area, particularly Chris. I think in this area too, you know. Yeah. The common yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, just the idea too of like, um, 
which I think, you know, is, is a fascinating connection to the idea of education and privilege, right? Because education is so, is very often this portal for people, oh. right? It opens, it, it, it literally, you know, opens the door to new knowledge, new relationships, um, new opportunities um, that you would not otherwise have, right? Um, and yet, um, you know, not everyone is, is, is afforded that opportunity, right? Or, or maybe even grows up expecting that, like kind of you, like you were saying in your, in your family, right? Um, well, yeah, and in my yeah. case, my parents, um, oh, I think it was $150 a year at that time. But, you know, that, that wasn't an easy thing for my parents to absorb. Uh, mm -hmm. uniforms and all the rest that we had to wear and everything that went with right. that uh, private girls school. It wasn't, we, yeah. we, we didn't stay at the school, you know, we lived at home. But yeah. uh, the fact that you, you sort of um, lived a little bit vicariously through many of your co-students and the mm -hmm. way that they lived and, what the, you know, what the nuns taught you, uh, I think led you to look for more in life. Hmm. And what you already knew. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Can I, can I just, um, go next? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was uh, intriguing as I was reading Gilb and reading some of the discussion posts that my students have posted, we at Bristol have a lot of students who come to our institution from a very similar background and perspective as the mm -hmm. author does. Yeah. You know, we have students who often feel that they should be working full time and not wasting time going to school. Mm. We have a lot of first generation students whose families have never been to college, have yeah. a hard time finishing high school. Um, so that was pretty powerful for me to, to see that that is everywhere at Bristol, you know, you know, when you, when you talk to students, we have a lot of students who are coming to our classrooms from a very similar background where school is just an alien, isolated, foreign place, you know, that, that could be intimidating. And I think going back to your point about how school creates these opportunities and relationships, um, there's a little big a piece of it that's not just the, the merits, right? It's also the, the cultural capital. Mm. You know, I, I got that from the reading that, you know, even though he had an education, he mm. sometimes even felt that he didn't have the cultural capital to, yeah. to so-called get ahead in life. And maybe from my experience, I could chime in on my experience too. I'm originally sure. from Turkey. Yeah. 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 Both my parents are, are teachers and, schooling and education was no brainer for me. I mean, it was just a given, you know, you're going to get a bachelor's. Yeah. There's no, <laughs> no questioning that. And I did, I did get a bachelor's master's PhD and all the way up, you know, uh, the ladder. But when I arrived in the United States uh, for my master's, I remember I lacked a lot of the network and the cultural capital and the relationships. Mm. And I did do construction too for a long time. <laughs> I, I, I worked in construction and if i remember i think brian mcguire who's also english faculty he did he did construction too because you know mm. with a humanities degree i mean I, my my degree was in political science and philosophy and nobody wants to hire a turkish foreign guy with a degree in political <laughs> science in the united states <laughs> who's yeah, gonna yeah. hire you so yeah, i did yeah. a lot of side jobs and so on and so forth so i felt that i lacked that network as well so the cultural piece plays a big role you know this guy with a weird name and accent political science degree in, from san diego state looking for a job it's it's difficult you know mm -hmm. um, so i could relate to the piece from my perspective as well but more yeah, so definitely. from from the perspective of our students who lack the privilege to be in school and the cultural background, the capital, and of course the expectations. I mean, the, the idea behind how, you know, we live up to those expectations, yeah. even though I had some challenges, I still had a lot of privileges that helped me through, get through this, right? And our, our students also lack that 
privilege. Yeah. And I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll stop talking. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> There's not too many of us here. So <laughs> um yeah, and I, I think you bring up uh uh I think you bring up a a great point um for any you know um uh students who may you know say you know watch this recording later is that i think sometimes uh you know students have perceptions of us as professors like that maybe we just grew up with a silver spoon in our mouths or like we've never um worked a day in our lives other than like reading books or something um which i think maybe you know maybe just says that you know as professors, we need to be more open with sharing our own stories, especially with our community college students of so just like, um, you know, because I think that they can perceive like, you know, this, we just sit in our offices and, and just, you know, read books while they're like struggling with life, right, of just yeah. like, oh, like I'm, um, you know, trying to like raise kids and like do a full time job also while doing work. Um, but yeah, I mean, that uh, especially um, for those of us who have uh, maybe started out as adjuncts, like working part time, you know, we had to like cobble work together, or like you said, Engin, you know, maybe you know we didn't get the you know coveted position that we wanted right out of school. Um, and I think you know you bring up a point too about just because uh, maybe you didn't like the idea, you know, you didn't maybe fit what people were looking for, like the stereotype or whatever. Um, it was interesting. I found uh, another, I was kind of looking at stuff for, you know, for the bio for Guild, um, and I found this, um, this biographical note. Um, I guess it's uh, from Texas State University, something called the Whitliff Collection, but um, there's some quotes in there. I guess there's like an interview, uh, or they pulled some stuff from an interview, and um, he, um, you know, he talked, so Gil talks about how, you know, he was able to gain entry into the post-college job market. And he says, he said this, he said, I'm kind of a, a, I'm a kind of big guy and particularly then, now I look sweet and nice, but then I looked mean and ugly and scared people. And so I could never get these white collar jobs. Men kind of backed away from me and women kind of looked for their purse. Um, so it's just, interesting you know he's basically saying i just didn't fit the stereotype of the scholar right um he i guess you know he looked more like he should be on a construction site i guess um, and his, his writing doesn't doesn't fit that mode either you know this it's piece, true yeah his writing that. is interestingly kind of um and i don't say this disparagingly no, but it, it kind no. of comes across in an unpolished sort of way i mean obviously he's got like He's got the writing bona fides, right? Oh, like, yeah, um, you know, yeah. when you hear his bio. Yeah. But you do wonder how much, yeah, even his, that he didn't immediately, like, escape into the ivory tower, or, you know, that oh. um, he spent his, he spent 16 years working on construction sites and stuff. Like, you wonder how much that impacted even his style, right? Um, yeah, I it, think he's in, he's... in an interesting way. Yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry for barging. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. <laughs> he's, he's deliberately trying to fail that normative uh, template discourse, right? That yeah. there isn't just one proper way of creating writing. Yeah. You know, expression exactly. of emotions yeah. and experiences can go in very, very, very different directions. And I think that's one of the reasons why, from the feedback that I'm getting from my students, they were able to relate to the author you know if it was just an exquisite essay about social injustices in the u.s they may not be able to relate to it it would be very you know academic and full of mm -hmm. academic jargon yeah. but he's yeah. he's writing from the voice of the people that are going through his experiences so he's much more relational and makes a lot more uh powerful statements that are you know, resonating with the experiences of our students. So I, I appreciate yeah. that. That's why I think the title is Hooray for the Losers. You know, the, the he's using really the term yeah. loser ironically, right? As a yeah. Yeah. right as like right. a querying of what is winner. You know, a winner is not necessarily a winner, it's just a 
you know, a template that's been imposed on people who are deemed to be winners, whereas others are deemed to be losers. Mm. Yeah, I, I, which winners, winners could be kind of synonymous for the privileged, right, in a way, like, or the most yeah. privileged, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kathleen, did you have a... a no, I was going to say, I think that's why, you know, when I, and I do, I mean, I don't always necessarily go to the place that I just, I just went to now, but yeah, you know, I do try to share with my students the fact that I didn't come from some golden bubble, you know, I didn't just drop into this classroom and uh, without anything yeah. going on prior to that in my life. And yeah, um, yeah. because I, I do feel it's very, very important. And I have some, you know, I've had over my 18 years now for me in adjunct, I've had some yeah. great students in that time and I still have. And I just yeah, think yeah. it's very, very important to have that kind of modeling that yes, you know, you can come from a very average situation and you can still, if you if you have the desire and uh, if you have the will, you can do what you like to do. Uh, mm -hmm. But you, you kind of need that. I think you need someone to tell you that in many ways. It doesn't have to be a direct, but you need someone to model the fact that yes, you know, I can be more than my more than maybe I thought I could be, which is, I think is a lot of it with a lot of these students that we have. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know, of course, if you want to invite Madeline, I don't know if she's on with us. <laughs> no, really. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 yeah. I don't see so what Madeline, Madeline has, has to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Madeline's actually in my, um, yeah. she's actually in my English 101 class and probably literally just finished reading this recently, I, I would say, Matt, right. when we're, we're looking at it this week. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts as an incoming student yeah. who's just kind of freshly read this piece. Um, um, I'm actually, I, I just haven't said anything because I'm um, a little hesitant about sharing, <laughs> especially if my kids are just kind of roaming around the house right now, but also- <laughs> It's all good. Uh, anxiety. Yeah. But I, um, I'm not sure that I can really relate to what any of you have actually said. Um, That's okay. I understand, <laughs> I understand it, but for me, yeah. um, the best days of my school, my best school days were in elementary school um, mm. until, you know, the kids were taught how to sit quietly and they were able to control themselves and not wiggle around constantly and um for me you know I wasn't great with writing things down without excuse me <laughs> just nervous for some reason no, but it's um okay. so I wasn't I wouldn't say that I'm only a visual learner but I do very well when, when I'm learning hands-on and visually, but um, yeah, yeah. we were given papers to fill out. And to me, I had never learned how to figure out the answers. I can't even talk right now, my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never learned how to, to um, do certain, figure out, oh, okay, we'll just use math for example. Yeah. I did not know how to divide um, because I wasn't paying attention. And it wasn't that I didn't want to, I just couldn't focus. So when I would get yeah. home and it was time to do homework, I was doing something else. And my mother, yeah. you know, she would make me sit down at the table where I would fall asleep and she found her own way of disciplining me. Um, and mm. when I told her that I didn't understand the work, she said that um, if I didn't understand it, it's because I didn't want to or because I wasn't paying attention. Um, mm. I didn't really get much from the school system for support um, after yeah. elementary school. I yeah. grew up for the most part, my teen years, I was in different programs and residential programs um, and Basically from the seventh grade up until 10th grade, um, I had no real education. Um, that is until last year when I decided to go to the adult diploma program. I didn't have any support from my mother 
Um, my yeah. father was a teacher for a while. Um, mm -hmm. And my mother raising four children, um, mm -hmm. she, I, I don't know how to put this, but um, she basically saw a lot of my father in me, very hyper, mm -hmm. very um, creative and you know, we love puzzles and all this other stuff, but we can't sit still for the life of us. Very mm -hmm. silly. And so she basically punished me for it. Um, yeah. Even trying to join the adult diploma program um, in New Bedford last year, she tried to discourage me, told me that I shouldn't try. She doesn't want to see me set myself up for failure and um, to just stay on SSI. Mm -hmm. I told her that I wanted to go into cybersecurity at some point or do something um, and you, uh, just anyway, yeah. I never really had support. And um, mm. when it comes oh. to school, I really don't know what there is for the high school experience. So I can't yeah. really compare yeah. a lot of mine with for example, for an ex Ugh. I don't know why yeah. I have so much anxiety right now sharing with you guys. No, Maybe it's okay. <laughs> talking about myself but um it's so okay thank you I, for sharing your story <laughs> with my children though I decided to homeschool them because I love teaching other people how to do different things I love the surprise on their face and the pride mm -hmm. that they show when when they figured something out and I like to be yeah. a part of that so my kids I started doing that with them I mean parents do that from day one um, when I had put them into public school, um, my then kindergartner was already learning. Um, he already knew how to read. He already knew how to multiply and was working on division. And yeah. then last year, after they gave back some of the tests that he had done, he, he hadn't learned anything pretty much. There was they were complaining that he wasn't sitting still. Basically the same things that <laughs> teachers said about me. Um, yeah. And then my other son, he is, he's at a sixth grade reading level and he is old, now he's in third grade. Um, but they took, whenever he gets frustrated and can't figure something out, he kind of expects someone to punish him. And when they don't, he punishes himself. Um, mm -hmm. He'll call himself stupid. He'll whatever. So I imagine being a teacher in the school, teaching a bunch of these kids that you can't stop for one child. Um, so they always sent him to the principal's office. They said that he was yeah. throwing fits. So this year I decided to go back into homeschooling. And oh my goodness, I'm going off on a tangent. I'm so sorry. No, it's it's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's I, all kind of, it's all, I mean, it all, related. yeah, it's all related to the expectations you grew up with, right? Yeah, um, yeah. about education and then just, uh, yeah, well, it strikes me that, I mean, I guess one thing I'm hearing too in your, your story is that, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, we've been talking about this idea and Gil brings this idea up as like, this idea of like a gateway to education as a like even just getting into education can be a privilege that not everyone has right this kind of a gateway yeah. there's gatekeepers but then um even within education itself our system our system tends to privilege or prize certain kinds of learners right um i mean I'm sure Engin could go on a rant at this point about industrialization and system education. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, like, you know, we talk, we think about that as for teachers all the time, like, like our system still, um, our, uh, our education system hasn't really evolved since the industrial age when the whole idea was like, well, students are just like cogs, you know, we just got to create cogs and just stamp them out. Right. And so, oh, yeah. um, you know, we prize, you know, our system prizes the compliant, quiet, obedient student, right? And, and um, 
I think in your case, Madeline, you know, you're just, you just weren't that kind of person. That's just not your temperament, right? You just don't fit that mold. And it sounds like, you know, some of your kids don't either. Um, and so that's, that's like almost kind of another form of privilege, right? It's like, if you are, you can be a good student and excel education wise in America, if, if you're the right kind of student, right? If you, if your temperament already fits what our system privileges and if not right you are um maybe labeled put in special programs right um yeah yeah um a stone age is not the word are not the word to use but like the instruction yeah. paradigm yeah. is not good for people who are hands-on learners people who are just sitting in a classroom all day and learning yeah. on a whiteboard, yeah. there's a way that you can keep them engaged, but if you can't find it, they're probably not gonna learn anything. And that was mm -hmm. my issue. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. when I went to the adult diploma program, I was afraid. I thought I was horrible at math. I've always thought that. Mm -hmm. I had always thought that. Um, and so I, I um sorry. Um so I ended up just taking some extra time with the teacher. He offered it to me. Um I always get nervous asking for help because I don't want to be a burden on other people. I grew up thinking that I was a burden. Um and so when he offered it, I was there any moment that I could be getting that extra help. And I actually realized that math was extremely easy and I was so proud of myself. It's like a, another puzzle for me. He always, yeah. he said yeah. that the good thing about math is that the bad news about math is that there are, are rules, but the good thing about math is that there are rules. And um, <laughs> once, yeah. once he put it that way to me, for some reason, that's what made it click for me. Mm. like okay I just need the instruction manual and I'm fine mm. and um, so I ended up yeah. doing really well with that and it was when I first started getting excited about math that I realized wow I might actually be able to learn more I might actually be good at other things I, I should go to college um, but at that mm. point I had no idea what I wanted to do right. and actually it was one of the other teachers there they always called me into the mm -hmm. offices when they needed help with their computers and one of them mentioned to me that I should you know, they thought I should go into cybersecurity. So for me, my problem is that I get distracted easily, very yeah. easily. I, I will go, I swear, I will go onto the e-learning website and um, let's say I go to English 101 and <laughs> I'm supposed to be doing just one thing, find the Zoom meeting link. And I go to where I think it is and I find all this other information and then I'm in a wormhole, that's it. Mm. I hyper focus on all the wrong things. It's really interesting. It might be helpful later. Those are the excuses that I tell myself. It's yeah. so just <laughs> distractibility and um, also not having faith in myself that I am doing, that I can do it, that I can mm. do the work that's possible for me, that those are the things that, um, stop me from thinking that I can even finish a semester here yeah. at BCC. I yeah. was actually excited about going to the college for my course. Um, but, you know, what happened? What was it? Bursted pipes? Uh, yes. Yeah. New Bedford. Bedford yeah, we're yeah. supposed to be at the New Bedford campus. <laughs> no, so it's, not, it's not going so great for me here. There's lots of distractions that I always yeah. feel like I need to take care of, even if they yeah. can be put off to later. Mm. Um, yeah. My goodness, I, I'm sorry, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but I haven't taken my ADHD medication today because it is at the pharmacy. So if I'm just <laughs> jumping, I'm jumping from this to that to this, and I'm sorry. It's okay, no, you're coherent. Um, yeah, no, I mean, you're the, you're the lone student here, so it's great to hear I mean, we, us faculty can just blab on and on about crap all day. So, <laughs> um, so it's great to hear a student, student perspective. And I think, 
Yeah, I mean, I think, again, something I was hearing you say kind of went back to what Kathleen was saying, that there was, it seemed like there finally was that point for you. And again, I see this with lots of students where there's that one teacher or that that person that um, opens up something, you know, somehow there's finally, there's that moment of just like where something clicks, right? Whether it's a subject or like a teacher who's just like, hey, like I actually see something in you, like you know, that you can do this. Um, it sounds like you got that and that's, you know, you're, you're, you're here because of that. Um, whereas otherwise you might not be, you might've given up. Just drifting off, um, yeah. But there was someone that. I don't think know. I would have given up, but I think that I would have put in less effort. Yeah. I, I would have, yeah, just waited until yeah. I failed. Yeah, yeah. Engin, you're our resident education professor here. I'm curious if you have yeah. any more thoughts about this in light of our discussion. Yeah, I have tons of thoughts, uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll uh, touch upon a few critical points, which I think are important. You know, the, the reading was really good at giving us tools to be more self-reflective and check our privilege, right? Yeah. And I think that's that's a crucial step for us to be more relational with our students, you know, being able to be fair and um, have more respect for our students. But we have to be very careful with how we do that. We there's this this very seductive trap that says, you know, you know, if I did it, so can you kind of mentality is. Mm is uh, going to turn off our students. So when you're deconstructing your privilege in the classroom, don't assume that since you had a hard time that your experience is very similar to your students. They may be going even, you know, a lot worse situations and there's intersectionality of, you know, experiences and privilege. So there's yeah. that danger. So there's the opportunity in deconstructing privilege but if you do it in a way to say, hey, look, if I did it, so can you, <laughs> that becomes a little bit of a turning off uh, point. So you got to be careful not to. Kind of a kind of a colorblindness, American yes. dream colorblindness of like any, you know, if you Absolutely. try hard enough, anybody Absolutely. where we forget about the yeah. systematic Absolutely. factors. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I, I think uh, going back yeah. to uh, Madeline and Kathleen's point about um, students, right, uh, being able to achieve and obtain success in these institutions. Uh, I think one of the obstacles that is out there other than the systemic stuff is, again, going back to expectations. Teachers and, and professors, we often tend to, again, it's a trap, blame the victim a lot. I mean, even, even someone like me who is educated, has a PhD in, in this kind of stuff, I still get seduced by blaming the students. You got to do that right. You know, don't don't put it on me. But uh, the, like the idea that, oh, they're just not motivated. They don't want to learn. Uh, you know, that's why they're not doing the work. Uh, is taking the path of least resistance, just putting the blame on the student. Uh, but the question is, is rather looking at what are the conditions that lead students to not get it done, right? It's not a point of they don't want to learn or they're not motivated to learn. I think the point is uh, the conditions are not right. I think this reading, again, highlights that idea that he was so motivated, right? He was so self-confident and excited, and he just, just couldn't get it done. He just didn't know how to get it done. The conditions were not right. So the, the correct way to approach this is students learn not because they want to, but because they can you know what i'm saying I feel so, yeah i think that's that's a crucial piece that we can take away from this this reading he wanted to learn he wanted to succeed he just couldn't yeah. and then again yeah. that that then later on speaks to privilege and systemic issues that are out there but that also wants you to question how your perspective and your expectations are being uh, structured by all this this whole discourse uh, so we have to yeah. be careful not to fall into that trap that, oh, this student is just lazy, doesn't want to learn. That's not always the case. Um, it's very powerful in that sense. 
Yeah. No, I'll stop yeah. Now. I mean, there's a whole host of things. I mean, it could be as simple as a condition as like the student wasn't self-aware enough to realize that they're not good at learning at 9.30 a.m. Whereas if yeah. they took this class at one o'clock, they'd actually get something as simple as that, like the time, the time, right, of like a class is just like, like, I'm just not as fully myself at 930 in the morning. <laughs> um, and again, that's not maybe, you know, it could be just like a self awareness thing, right. So yeah, it's, um, I think that's, yeah. a, that's an interesting one for us, right, because we are, well, we are partly responsible as educators for creating the conditions of learning. Obviously, the institution we are part of is another yeah. big factor of that, right? So there's there's things we control, there's things we don't control. Um, so it's, uh, but then there's also like, there's the other factors in the student's life, right? Everything in the student's life is another part of the situation, right? Which, yeah. you know, yeah. obviously that's that can be the other thing, right? Um, and again, <laughs> you know, you get the email from the student who's like, oh, I'm like, late or they just never hear back and we um in our less charitable moments we're just like ah like the students just like flaking off or you know why aren't they when who knows right like we we're unaware of like the whole other um circle of things you know in the students private life that that are happening that you know yeah. that are impacting them that we're not yeah. aware of and yeah. i think the third piece is okay how do we get students to actually can right if they're motivated if they want to do it but they can't how do we move from can't to can and i think this this essay is a testament for that as well um you know how can you publish if, if you're motivated and yet you can't write english like an exquisite writer does right mm. so gilb kind of exemplifies how the can can be can <laughs> i'm talking like a riddle how the can can be done, <laughs> right? How you how can you have the motivation, but at the same time, have the the artifact to show you that you, you are able to do it. So maybe we we have to think about that in our classrooms as well. It's a little bit easier for maybe humanities classes. You know, like I'll give you an example of a student that I had, who I kept remembering as I was reading uh, the story. Uh, he was not able to do exams. I mean, exams were just so mainstream, right? I mean, it takes a lot of years of practice to be able to address a question designed by the professor and, you know, incorporate quotations and proper citations and so on and so forth. He had the motivation, but he couldn't, right? Mm. So I told him, okay, just write, write whatever you want to write about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in any shape and form you like. And yeah. he wrote, he wrote lyrics. He wrote like a poetic yeah. piece for me. Yeah. So at that moment, I enabled his can using his motivation. Mm. He yeah. was able to get it done and not just through trying to pressure himself to write it in an exquisite essay format, like the way I wanted as a mainstream scholar, but he wrote it mm. the way that excited him, that made more sense to him. And I think that was much more powerful than him struggling to write proper English. English faculty might be a little upset with me. Right? Yeah. No, <laughs> but, I love that. Like, yeah. like the, there's the rethinking, like what, we'll do I mean, I think that factors into, you know, all these, I mean, I think that's a good thing that that's like a very practical way to think about like equity, right? As we're thinking about, um, you know, at, at, for, at Bristol, you know, we're thinking about, you know, this agenda that's been, you know, kind of handed down to us from the state which I think is, you know, a, a good goal, right? Um, but yeah, it's practical things like what, what do, what will we accept as artifacts of learning, right? You know, we again, as part of just the mainstream industrial age system, we still have these certain things of like, well, you must do a, a, a paper or this type of thing. Um, uh, but you know, is that a uh, that can be a barrier to you know certain <laughs> students, right? Um, it doesn't mean that they they aren't learning, you know, or um, gaining the skills, but maybe they just um, present them in in a different way, right? So, like, yeah, how do we how do we rethink like that idea of like you know the proofs of learning, artifacts of learning? I, yeah, I yeah, I think that's well, great. I think, to think, about. I think yeah. too, Chris. I think if we offer up different opportunities, like I'll use lyrics in poetry in the poetry section that I cover in 102. Right. Uh, you know, I, th I think it's important for us 
to, to give out various ways that students can give back. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think then that many times that plugs into, uh, you know, we're able to plug into something that they're uh, attracted to. I, I start that section of poetry with lyrics mm -hmm. and I ask them to pick a favorite song and I have them get up. I don't know what I'll be able to do now, you know, but when we will totally live, yeah, I have yeah. them get up, present that uh, song to the class. We'll pull it up on a video and, you know, they talk about the song and what it means to them and on and on. And, and, and then I find many times that they're able to relate to some segments of different types of poetry because they've had that relationship with something they're very attached to, the music. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's about, it's always about trying to find those those connections, right? Yeah, between st what students may already connect. And even to like this, um, I mean, that, that's a good example of like, um, especially in the humanities, oftentimes what, or at least what the tradition gives us is what we kind of call like high culture, right? And something like song lyrics to a rap song or a pop song is, you know, low culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, some, sometimes, I mean, I, I don't necessarily do this anymore because I, I bring pop culture stuff into my classes all the time, but sometimes, I think, yeah, sometimes I think there's this expectation that we have to bring students up to high culture, um, uh, which is, you know, not necessarily bad in some sense of like, you know, introducing them to certain things they may not know about, but, but yeah, often the connection is through maybe some of those, the things that are more where they're, they're at, or just showing too, like the connections, like, yeah, like I've told, I've told, I, I've done that before where I've like started a poetry section, English 102, and I'm like, you know, uh, how many of you like poetry? Maybe a few of them raise their hands and I'm like, how many of you like, you know, music and song lyrics and a bunch of them yeah. raise their hands. I'm like, I'm like, you actually like poetry. And then of course, then I have to, you know, make that connection for them, but. But that's okay. yeah, for sure. That's how yeah. I started writing songs. I love poetry. Hmm. But anyway, sorry. No, okay, I, got, no. I, got, I got to that's jump good. into another meeting. I'm sorry. I, I have to leave the conversation. No, no well, that's, I figured, I mean, we are, it is 2.59. So um, I figured we'd, Thank you. we'd kind of wrap up anyway. Lynn, um, did, you, did Lynn want to add anything? Hi. <laughs> yes, Hi. I'm, I'm still here. Hi. <laughs> no, the what got me motivated in high school in the 10th grade is my uh, guidance counselor told me that I would never amount to anything. So I should just marry a rich guy. Oh, absolutely. He told well. me. And that, <laughs> he owed me so much. Yeah. I, I never went back to him, but I... Yeah. Whatever it was, it made me go, huh, I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the rest there is just, it wasn't privilege. I was very, very, very poor, came from a very poor, very small community in upstate Pennsylvania. And yeah. talk about inbreeding. It was a lot of inbreeding. I was fortunate my mother was not from the area. So oh. I did get it, you know, a lot of inbreeding mm -hmm. there. And nobody went to high school. And I mean, nobody even went to high school, never mind going to college. So, yeah. well, you know, I managed to. But that guidance counselor put a bug up your butt, and that was it. He did. Yep. Yep. <laughs> he did. I've had a student a couple of years ago who heard the same statement from one of her science professors at Bristol. Yeah. I don't know if oh. that's bad. That's bad. Oh, uh, wow. That's yeah. not good to hear. Not oh. great. So, so I don't know if that person is still with us. I don't have to take science classes, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very yeah, common, common microaggression. Yeah. Well, that, that something should be done about that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to close the door and you're there with the student. Anyway, I, I do have an advising appointment, so I have to head off. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it was a small group of us, but I think we had a, a great little conversation. So yeah, hopefully maybe next time we'll have maybe some more people, but if not, you know what, we'll just continue to have good conversations with whoever's here. Um, thank you all for coming.
Uh, have a good rest Thank of your you week. Thanks for hosting. We'll see you later.